Greetings, mortals! Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court Din Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, and run. Get out while you still can. Save yourself while you're still innocent of the horror that is Sci-Fi High the Movie Musical! Look, I know what you're thinking. Come on, Diva. Sure, it may be lousy, but we can take it. After all, that's what we come to this silly YouTube channel for, right? You have no idea. Sci-Fi High is bad. I'm talking Manos bad. The Room bad. How has this not been featured on Best of the Worst yet bad? And that's all I can tell you about it, because if the internet is any indication, a large majority of the world is blissfully ignorant of this movie's existence. It has an IMDb page and a DVD on Amazon, but there's no reviews, no Wikipedia entry, no TV Tropes page. If I didn't know better, I would swear this movie was spawned from the pits of here specifically for the purpose of tormenting me. In fact, I'm still not entirely convinced that isn't the case. Aw, oh, come on, Eddie. It's not that bad. Yeah, it's worse. Your words, not mine. Last chance. You sure you wouldn't rather watch something with cute baby animals or a metal cover of the DuckTales theme song? No? <sighs> On your own head be it. Let's examine the case of Sci-Fi High, the movie musical. Right away there seems to be a bit of confusion, as the promotional materials for the film call it Sci-Fi High, the movie musical, but the on-screen title says Far Height High, the sci-fi movie musical. At least there's a consensus that A. This is a movie musical, B. It takes place in a high school, and C. Sci-fi is somewhere involved in the proceedings, which makes this the most coherent information we'll receive from the movie. According to the school exposition announcements, Sadie Hawkins' day is fast approaching and the girls are eagerly singing about who they want to invite to the school dance. They can. You do not need to update your prescription. The focus is really that terrible. Sin number one, even for a low-budget film, the production values are abysmal. The scenes are rarely lit or framed effectively and are shot in whatever public area the film crew managed to sneak into. The DVD cover looks like one of those find the grammar mistakes assignments you do in English. But the sound is the worst. You'd think you'd want to put a little effort into your sound editing in a musical, but you're not this movie. The balance between the music and the voices is way off, and most of the songs have this bizarre echo effect that makes the lyrics incomprehensible. Which, judging by what we can hear of them, might be deliberate. Having introduced, for lack of a better term, our female protagonists, it's time to get acquainted with their male counterparts, three of the oldest teenagers since Rydell High opened its doors. The would-be hero is Billy Deaver's budding science geek and boring generic male lead. His best friend is Eddie Cassavetti, wannabe ladies' man and sin number two. You expect a character like Eddie to be a little tactless when it comes to approaching the opposite sex? But this guy is especially repulsive about it. Hey, remember, when you're rounding second, don't take no for an answer. <laughs> it's the implied rape that makes it funny. His courtship of the very unwilling Peggy Myers also has strong overtones of emotional abuse. Look, you grease ball, I don't have to go to the dance with you because I don't think that I... <laughs> oh, God. Peggy. Peggy Sue. What okay, have I ever done to you, but... You too much. The movie thinks this is funny, but it's uncomfortable and wrong. You get the feeling Peggy's just trying to prevent Eddie from storming the Sadie Hawkins dance with a shotgun. Rounding out the trio is Spuds, who is theoretically Russian, although that doesn't amount to anything beyond a few dirty commie remarks from Eddie. Spuds is the only member of the trio with a girlfriend, which wrangles on Eddie to the point where he proposes a little wager. I bet you... That not only do I get Peggy Myers to ask me to the dance on Saturday night, but I also go with her to Promise Pass to do the nasty dance before you get anywhere with Lane or Licka or whatever it is you call her now. 
I did not think it was possible, but that just outstripped the wager in Love Never Dies as the single stupidest plot point in a musical. The bet in Love Never Dies was just idiotic and contrived and betrayed disturbing gender issues. The bet in this movie is idiotic and contrived and betrays disturbing gender issues and has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the film. It's seldom brought up again and there's never any payoff for it. It's only there so Eddie has motivation to horn in on Peggy and, let's be honest, the only motivation this character really needs to do that is dangling between his legs. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the Fine. stakes yet. What are wages? Haircuts. Why? Because whoever loses is going to get a buzz. Buzz? Eddie's also miffed at Billy leaving their amateur doo-wop group to pursue sciency stuff, but Billy has given up on music and adamantly refuses to sing for reasons that, like so much of this movie, will never be made clear. That doesn't stop him from launching into a tune while the guys drive home through the Money for Nothing universe, though. Oh. I'm not sure I can even iterate all the levels of fuckery going on in this number, but I'm going to try. The echo effect, again, is irritating, the CGI background is horrible, the flying car is a pointless affectation, not to mention a huge grease ripoff, Spud's verse in Russian comes completely out of nowhere and not in a funny way, more of a confusing and stupid way. And most of all, even in a musical, you can't have a character singing an I want song if his refusal to sing is practically the only character developed development he's ever given. <sighs> How far are we into this movie again? You know, I'm stuck with this material. You can still get out and browse Watch Mojo if you'd like. The next day, the guys have class with Professor Vaden, who is tossing out crazy mad scientist signals like a Shriner with a bag full of Jolly Ranchers, including feeding some science stuff to a Venus flytrap. If that thing starts singing like Levi Stubbs and eating the rest of the cast, we might just save this movie. Also attending the class is the school's resident asshole jock, Brandon Bishop. Uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, let me think about it. Uh, yeah. Who cares? Wow, movie, you are really not doing a good job of making me hate your bully antagonist. Anyway, the male trio thinks Brandon needs to be taken down a peg, and they put on their best bargain basement greaser costumes and throw a ball at his head during the big basketball game. The rest of the team immediately seeks vengeance, and while Spuds is able to escape with his girlfriend in the getaway car, the other two are not so lucky. Ugh, High School Musical did a better job of using basketballs as percussion. See what you made me do, movie? You made me praise High School Musical. Damn you to hear! Just when I thought this place wasn't swarming enough with men wearing trench coats smoking cigarettes out of darkened end folds, you all have to cross paths with me. Just like some five-headed black cat skulking underneath my ladder. Okay, dial it back, buddy. The scenery in this movie isn't good enough to chew. Cut rate Wallace Shawn here is Principal Thompson, whose long unhinged rant indicates that he suspects some secret evil lurking in the school or that he really misses Drama Club. Bottom line, everybody gets detention and an overnight oh, no. at the local police station. Now might be a good time to discuss sin number five. What exactly is this movie trying to accomplish? What does it want us to feel when we watch it? I'm guessing that the writers think this is a parody of 1950s B-movies, but they don't really know how to work the tropes for comic effect. Or any other effect, for that matter. It's not silly like The Lost Skeleton of Cadavra, it's not transgressive like Rocky Horror, it's not nostalgic like Grease, and it's not surprisingly genuine like Little Shop of Horrors. It's just... bizarre. So, let's check back in with the girls, shall we? Peggy and her friend Kara Ann are discussing the fact that they need dates for the dance, as well as the fact that they are on the dance committee and need to find a talent act for the big day. 
Kara Ann would like to ask Billy to fulfill both roles for her, but she can't talk to him because teenage crush and awkward plotting. Besides, Billy's still doing the I won't sing, don't ask me thing, and not even Brandon Bishop threatening his friends with noogies is enough to sway him. I'm starting to think that having Billy sing about how difficult it is for him to sing is supposed to be ironic, but the random fantasy sequences are as badly shot and dubbed as everything else in this movie, so it doesn't amount to much. Peggy has problems of her own, as apparently she's Brandon's ex, and the sight of him making out with a random blonde in the hallway sends her crying to the girls' room. Unluckily for her, it happens to be the same girls' room that Eddie has mistakenly wandered into to take a dump. What are you doing in here? Listening to you, and I'm very interested. Okay. Tell me who you are. I am your angel of music. Eddie manages to persuade Peggy to ask him to the dance, sight unseen, and Peggy is not too thrilled when she discovers her mystery date. Though, to be fair, Eddie doesn't drag out the charade any longer than necessary, which puts him one up on Michael from Greece too. And any victory he might feel is short-lived, as he still has to serve detention with Principal Thompson. <laughs> the fact that someone, somewhere, is almost certainly getting off on that scene is the scariest thing to happen in this movie so far. Luckily for Billy, Professor Vaden shows up and convinces Thompson to let Billy serve out his sentence in the science lab. So at least Billy's no longer with the creepy, crazy, well, actually it's more of a lateral move, but at least Vaden is giving Billy a good outlet for his scientific interests and letting him handle the green science stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now bring it down, be careful. Careful. Wow. Absolutely nothing happened! In fact, we are fast approaching the two-thirds mark in this movie, and nothing interesting has happened. There's been no progress on Vaden and his weird plants, the whole Sadie Hawkins thing has been a bust, we've had three potential antagonists, the bully jock, the mad scientist teacher, and the sadistic principal, who have contributed no meaningful conflict, and the alien invasion that was promised on the DVD cover hasn't even been remotely hinted at. All we've had is nearly an hour of random, barely coherent nonsense from a disturbing array of awful people, and if that's really your idea of entertainment, you can just go on Twitter for 60 minutes. Faden gives Billy a good luck charm in the form of one of the mysterious plant vines, which, given the fact that it's still twitching, is probably not a good sign. The next morning, while Billy and Kara Ann avoid talking to each other, we get a little he said, she said recap of the Eddie Peggy situation. How did this happen? He convinced me to ask him while in the girls' room, while using a toilet. We were alone, we were vulnerable. It's kind of romantic. We just let it all out. Well, now I know what hell is like. Well, I mean, I've always known because I live here, but I finally have an understanding of what you people go through when you first come down. Kara Ann finally works up the courage to ask Billy to the dance, and he finally works up the courage to agree to sing for the dance, so that's one non-conflict out of the way. Unfortunately, Billy's good luck vine has mysteriously vanished, and he's getting side stitches and vomiting up green goo, which could put a damper on things. And Professor Vaden is acting increasingly weird and getting all don't look at my notes on Billy, but he manages to deflect any further inquiry with his tales of being an adventuring botanist. Did I ever tell you about the time when I was canoeing on the Tigris and piranhas managed to wheedle their way into my loins? Never say loins again. Or wheedle. Y you know what? Just don't talk at all. It's safer. The night of the dance arrives with Eddie bragging about his plans to get into Peggy's pants and the girls showing up in their laziest attempt at 1950s formal wear. 
That's not even the laziest thing about this dance. It's pretty much the most boring wedding reception in existence, with terrible pseudo-Elvis on the soundtrack, the background being filled up by all the writer's relatives who couldn't think up an excuse to get out of the filming day, and a lot of random shots of people looking at each other intercut with the whitest white bread dancing you can imagine. No wonder Spuds and his girlfriend decide to ditch early and head to make out point. It's almost a relief when Billy gets called up to do his big solo. Yes, the innuendo is, I fear, intentional. No, the rest of the song doesn't justify it, especially since it's as incomprehensible as the rest of the music we've heard so far. Uh Uh-oh, looks like someone dumped pig's blood on Carrie White again. Yes, some thing is attacking the students and the doors have been mysteriously locked, which means we're finally getting the spooky thrills we've been denied thus far. manner of speaking. Pretty much everything from here on out is going to count for sin number nine. It's pretty smart of the directors to only give us brief glimpses of whatever is maiming and killing the extras, since given their budget, it's their best chance of instilling any kind of fear or suspense in the audience. But they whiff it big time. There hasn't been enough build-up to whatever it is that's happening to make us care, and the characters certainly haven't done anything to make us care whether they live or die. And given the terrible acting and the cheap stage blood and editing which is just as random and incoherent as the rest of the movie, the entire effect is just ridiculous rather than horrifying. Billy, Kara Ann, Eddie, and Peggy manage to escape through the red-washed corridors to a safe place. Billy wants to go find Principal Thompson because he might have the keys or a phone or something. Kara Ann goes with, but Peggy is too scared and Eddie is still trying to score, so they stay behind. Luckily for Peggy, they're devoured before Eddie can date rape her. (laughs) Billy is nabbed by Professor Vaden and taken to the upper reaches of the school, and I can't wait to hear this. No, really, I am absolutely dying to know what resolution this movie thinks is worth the past 75 minutes of non-build-up. The ones patrolling the grounds are a seedling species generated through the use of a human specimen, and promulgation conjoined with oxygen. Uh, yeah, something about the tendril absorbing into Billy's skin, and now the alien plants have bonded with him, and he's been vomiting seedlings, which are now running amok all over the school, and also Vaden's an alien, I guess? That's about as disappointing as I figured. Billy's not so crazy about the idea of being an alien broodmother, but it takes him a while to figure out what he's going to do about it, despite some pretty obvious leading statements by Vaden. They survive and thrive off your presence. They quite actually are alive because of you. Do I have to draw you a diagram? Jump off the building already! Billy finally gets around to figuring out he needs to sacrifice himself to save the human race, but not before he gets one last song in. And a slight detour through the end of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. While Kara Ann and Spud's girlfriend, um, Lane, I think her name's Lane, comfort each other, Vaden plays the traumatized survivor, but Thompson exposes him as an alien, which he knows all about because honestly, I don't give a fuck right now. That man is no man at all. He's a Marlothian. Shoot him. Alas, the police only shoot Thompson, leaving Vaden to groom Spuds as Billy's successor, making absolutely sure that the entire movie we just witnessed was completely pointless. Play us out, stupid innuendo song. Out of all the low-budget movies I've seen, this is definitely the most... inexplicable. 
Sci-Fi High is a mess of repulsive characters muddling around with barely realized ideas until it stumbles through its unsatisfying ending. The movie is so incompetent, idiotic, and downright unpleasant in so many ways that I can't even begin to know who should suffer the most for it. I'm not sure I can make any of them suffer more than I have already. So, I think it's best that we find that landfill with all the E.T. video games, throw this movie in with them, and then do our best to forget its existence. So let it be recorded. Or not. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned.